Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas Whitaker. I am the Training and Development Manager on the News Lab at Google, uh, and I'm welcoming you back to our next edition of the News Lab Data Visualization Roundup with Alberto Cairo. Say hello, Alberto. Hey, hello. How are you? Nice to be here again. Yeah, it's good to see you again. So for those of you who are just joining us or maybe aren't familiar with this uh, particular lineup, uh, every month we pull in Alberto Cairo to talk about data visualization and what's going on in the world today. Um, he gives us a lot of great feedback and input about you know, what's going on in the world of data visualization, and we're going to take a look at a, quite a few really amazing uh, examples today that you just sent me a little bit ago. Uh, Alberto, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. I, I believe you have a conference coming up. And, uh, yes, a yeah, for, those of, for those of you who are joining us for the first time and don't know who I am, I teach at the, I am a professor at the University of Miami at the School of Communication. I teach, teach data visualization and infographics and a little bit of data journalism. And before that, I was infographics director at several news organizations like El Mundo in Spain and Epoca Magazine in Brazil. And I'm also the author of a couple of books, The Functional Art, and most recently, just published this year, The Truthful Art, which deals a little bit more with um, data journalism itself. So, well, happy to be here again. So how should we do this? Should, I, should we get started right away? Yeah, let's just jump right into it. I know we got a lot to go over. I want to make sure we have time to do it. Wow. And while, while you're getting set up, uh, Alberto, you can go ahead and present. And then while you're getting that set up, I uh, just wanted to remind our viewers and people who are dialing in, you can add your questions into the chat uh, on YouTube. Uh, so follow that YouTube link, uh, add your questions in. We'll jump in and ask, answer some of those questions during the presentation today uh, as it makes sense. Yeah, that makes, yeah, that's great. Let me just share my screen right now. So as you were saying, we have tons of stuff to, to see today. The, the way this usually works, for those of you who, are, who have uh, not joined us in previous uh, office hours or whatever you want to call these, is that I, I basically go over several interesting things in relationship to visualization that I have seen in the past month or so. So I sent Nicholas this very long list of things that I liked and that I thought that it were, uh, were worth highlighting. So I will go over that in just one second. So the first thing that I would like to highlight is something that was done uh, by Google itself in collaboration with other people. It's a uh, tilegrams. So this is um, a blog post that was written by uh, Simon Rogers, who, as uh, probably some of you know, works for um, a, a Google a, in a Google News Lab and, and Google Trends. And Simon is basically heading several projects uh, that will be that are published on a regular basis. And a full disclosure, some of you already know about these, but just in case, um, I, I also work in some of these projects. Not in this one in particular, but in other Google projects that will be released in months to come. I cannot say any, anything else about them until they are published. Anyway, so the Tilegrams is a free tool uh, to create a cartograms. A cartogram, for those of you who use a data visualization on a regular basis, is a map in which you distort the different areas uh, or the different regions according to some sort of variable. So, for example, population, right? So, the problem with the uh, normal, traditional map of the United States, for instance, is that states that have very small population, like Montana or the Dakotas, are very, very large in terms of territory, in terms of size, right? So that distorts any data that you put on them. So a cartogram could be a good alternative uh, or a good solution to that problem. In a cartogram, you can scale the different regions according to population. So tilegrams is basically a tool that lets you create that kind of map a, a quite easily, right? So I'm, going to, I'm just scrolling down a, these a blog posts by Simon, Simon, in which he describes several uses of the cartogram. So, for example, one when the voting for Brexit was uh, taking place in the UK, many, many organizations used hexagon based cartograms. This is another um, hexagon based cartogram created by a 538. This is part of their wonderful um, a predictive a model. A visualization page, which I, by the way, I recommend that in previous in previous uh, office hours. And here you have an explanation of how Tilegrams work. This is completely free. You just launch the, the the program. You can upload your data, and then you basically can uh, tell the software what level of detail uh, you want. By the way, this was done. You know, I, for, I forgot to mention that it was done in collaboration with Peach Interactive. So if, if you open the software over here, just clicking on the Clicking on this, you will see how this works. So you can load an existing data set 
or you can load your 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 own data. You can generate the map from data, and then you just uh, you can you can basically select that. I'm going to, for example, select 538 model, and then down here you can refine your cartogram by giving it more or less level of detail. And then after you have finished working with the with the tool, I'm just going to reduce that so you can see a little bit more. Once you can do that, you can export this as a JSON file, or you can export it as an SVG, which, as you know, is is basically a, basically a vector. A, a graphic so you can use this map in your own uh, projects. I think that this is a wonderful tool. It's super simple to use, very, very useful. And it follows a trend that I highlighted in previous office hours, which is where we're seeing more and more of these tools being released on a regular basis. Some of them are completely free. Some of them have a freemium model. Uh, some of them are open source. Some of them are not. But in any case, we're seeing a, an increasing number of software tools that can, can be extremely uh, helpful for a data visualization. Uh, stop me at any point if you want, otherwise I will just keep moving. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was just going to jump in really quick, and it looks like you had a, have a couple of examples that we can show yeah. um, mm -hmm. of those kind of brands. But from like, a, and actually, I'm just going to mute you for a second, Albert, because we got a mean echo. Uh, but as far as like, um, you know, cartograms go specifically, or the, the use of these hexagon uh, you know, shapes, you know, is there a benefit to that particular shape? Like how come, you know, we use hexagons versus like another uh, particular type of visualization? And just remember to unmute yourself there. I think you might still be muted there, Alberto. Yeah, you got to click on the little uh, red uh, microphone Ooh, okay. icon. There you go. Hey, there you go. We can hear you now. Okay. Sorry about that. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so I have seen I have seen examples of cartograms based on hexagons. I have seen examples of cartograms based on smooth shapes. So if you search for the word cartogram in Google, you will see different models of, of cartograms. Uh, so for example, this one, a smooth cartogram in which you distort these in a very organic manner. Some of them are based on rectangles, some of them are based on hexagons. I tend to prefer cartograms that are based on a geometric shapes, like rectangles and hexagons. I think that cartograms like, like this one distort the regions a little bit too much. They look a little bit, a little bit too weird. But I don't have any, any sort of very specific preference for them. I cannot really say scientifically that one of them is better than the other, just because I, I believe that they need to be tested scientifically in the lab to see which one of them works better. Yeah, but I, from like a stylistic yeah. standpoint, just kind of like from a design standpoint. Yeah, from a design like standpoint, it's yeah, from standpoint. Clear. yeah I, I tend to prefer things that are based on geometric shapes. So for example, this recent project by The Guardian, it was published just a few days ago, which is about the um, hygiene rates of restaurants all over the UK. Well, basically, you, it, it, it actually helps you to, to click on any any region, right? So you just click on that, and you just compare one region to the other region, right? It's much easier to navigate navigate than a, than a, than a graphic that is based on uh, shapes that are not regular, right? So that's this is my preference, right? And I really like hexagon cartograms. They give you more freedom in terms of uh, drawing the different shapes a, a more according to reality, more according to how they really look like a, in the real world. That makes a lot of sense. Let's go ahead and uh, share your screen again, and let's take a look at that Guardian example you were just talking about. Yeah, let's, let's, go, let's do that. Let me see over here. So uh, screen share over here, share. So this is the Guardian project that I, I was mentioning before, this graphic over here. And remember, by the way, that all these links will be available uh, right underneath uh, the video. This is just for the audience, so you will be able to take a look at all these things. So this this project over here, right? So this is a, some example of using rectangles. But as I said before, I usually I also I also like hexagons quite a lot because they, they give you more freedom, right? I really like this map by five thirty eight. By the way, it's one of probably one of my favorite visualizations in the current uh, in the current election coverage. Anyway, so that's that's about the yeah the first two. 
Uh, another project that I would like to highlight today is called uh, Data Sketches. And I'm still in the process of navigating, uh, navigating this uh, project. This is by uh, a project by two designers, uh, Nighty Bremer. I, I hope that I'm not mispronouncing your name. Sorry about that. So, Nighty Bremer and Shirley Wood. So these are basically two visualization designers that are challenging each other to create visualizations about specific topics every month. So, so far, they have done a couple of visualizations in July and then a couple of visualizations in, in August. In August, the topic that they chose was the Olympics. The uh, visualization in September will be, the two visualizations in September will be about uh, travel. They are, as I said, he, it says here, uh, it's currently on the works. But the work here is a little bit closer to, to data art. Right? This, is, this is more, the, the, what makes this project so beautiful is the, expressive power of some of these visualizations. So, for example, here we have one about the, about the Olympics. Let me see if it loads correctly here. So you can compare them side by side. This is so, so beautiful. It's really well done. I'm not sure that it's great as, as, an, analytic, as a, an analytics tool, but certainly it looks very beautiful in terms of a creative style. And one of the things that I like the most about this project, about data sketches, is that when you click on read more here in the middle, you can see not only the final results in comparison of the two designers' uh, projects side by side, but there's also a short article about them, right? So you can read how about how, how these projects were done. Uh, these articles are a lot of fun. They are written with a lot of humor. And they also publish these sketches. I, I'm really a huge fan of hand-drawn sketches when it comes to planning for visualization projects. So this is a this is an example of that. So I am foreseeing that they will probably in the future they will try to transform these into some sort of book, like um, a Georgia Lupi and Stephanie Posavec's um, Dear Data. If you haven't heard about that project, by the way. Uh, the data it's a it's another example of collaboration between two visualization very famous visualization designers and and i really really recommend that you take a look at it it has a website drdata.com as you can see and they have a book coming out so this project is, is similar it is different in other senses but it's, it's similar in the sense that it's two very talented visualization designers uh, challenging each, each other and the results are a, a, at least very very intriguing and as I said before, what I like the most is the is the articles that they wrote about each one of the projects. I think that this is going to be extremely helpful for students. If you teach data visualization, I would really recommend that you follow this project because they do describe the creative process in a lot of uh, a lot of detail. You know, I think that's one of the things that really interests me most about this this particular these last two examples is you know it really talks about the creative process. It's showing the work and really giving people the opportunity to see you know really what goes into the previs uh, behind data visualizations before you actually get them out into the public. Exactly, that's a very important point, and it's something that we discussed about uh, in in previous podcasts. Uh, visualization is not just about showing your work, meaning the final the end result of the process. It's also important to show the process. It's because uh, visualization is not just about graphic design. It's also about you know, the process of how you manipulated the data, you know, the assumptions about the data, how you gather it, your sources, etc. That's why it's so important to, to explain that process to people, for people to understand if your assumptions are right or if the methods that you use to create your graphics are sound or not. So data sketches, very, very interesting. Uh, congratulations on the work, and Adi and Shirley, if you are listening, this is a, a very, very promising project, and I really hope that it becomes a book in the future. Just because I love printed books, right? I, I rather prefer printed books and not ebooks. I hope that I will have to, I, I will be able to have this book on my shelves in the future. If you decide to create one. Um, anyway, okay. So that that's. Oh, by the way, I, we should not forget that the information is beautiful. A awards long list has already been published. I'm going to be, I'm going to have to launch Safari over here because our website doesn't work on my Chrome browser. So information is beautiful awards. If you're interested in seeing what's going on in the world of data visualization and infographics lately, uh, perhaps you should take a look at, at their website. So information is beautiful awards has been going on for several years in the past. It, and if you take a look at their long lists, they are, you know, great resources. They provide. They can provide great uh, inspiration 
a, for visualization designers. So the long list is here. You can click on that and you can see several, uh, the, the different categories of the awards. A full disclosure, I am a judge in the, in the awards. It's important to remember that. And my, and my web blog, thefunctionalart.com, is part of the long list in the visualization website of the year. I have never won the awards. I do believe that there are much better websites than mine. Uh, and this year, we are competing with, with, with uh, people like 538.com. It's kind of crazy, right? How, how can a small web blog published by an individual uh, compete with such a wonderful website uh, as 538? In any case, here is your recommendation. The information is beautiful awards. And it looks like also our colleague Simon Rogers is also one of the judges as well. Oh, yeah. Is Simon there? Well, I didn't see that. I say I have to navigate the entire website. It's so huge. It has so many things. Some of the examples, by the way, I highlighted them uh, in the list that I provided you. For example, one of the, one of the graphics that made, to, made it to the long list is these enormous hand-drawn uh, visualization by uh, XKCD. For those of you who are not familiar with XKCD, it's a wonderful uh, website that publishes uh, cartoons, a uh, very humorous, very geeky, very nerdy, wonky cartoons about science, programming, coding, and also data visualization. And the author is uh, Randall uh, Munro, who has a, a book uh, recently published called uh, Think, Six Think Explainer, if I'm not wrong. It's a very interesting book full of a hand-drawn data visualization. So this is a, how global temperatures changed in the past 20,000 years. So the vertical axis is time, and the horizontal axis is variation of global temperatures in comparison to an average. And the average is the average temperatures between 1961 and 1990. So you can see if the world was either warmer or colder than it was in this uh, period of time. So historically, the world was uh, much colder, so four degrees Celsius colder than the average, than this 20th century average. And then you can scroll down and see the world becoming a little bit warmer. The graphic is full of little annotations, little charts, little you know, visual jokes here and there, and puns. And then you can move forward, 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 and see how the world gets warmer and warmer. Then we get, it gets colder, it gets warmer again. Right, warmer and warmer, and then you get closer to the present. So we are still in two two thousand uh, years before uh, Christ. We go here. We keep moving, moving, moving. The world gets a little bit warmer, and then we get to the present, in which global temperatures basically sky, uh, spike up very, very quickly. So this this is a this graphic. It's uh, very similar to the uh, one of my favorites and one of the most controversial uh, for the wrong reasons. A visualizations ever created, which is the hockey stick chart by several climate uh, scientists. For example, um, I think here this, all right, so this is the this is the graphic that I was talking about. So this is the hockey stick chart, which was uh, created between 1998-1999, and then it got it got famous in 2001 uh, when it was published by the uh, uh, intergovernmental uh, panel for climate change to study climate change. One of the authors is uh, Michael Mann, who has several books about climate change that are actually quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, Michael E. Mann, a hockey stick chart. This is one of the authors. And recently, he published a book. I'm trying to find the, the title of the book that he published recently. Um, let me just look for his name in Amazon.com, Michael E. Man, it's because I, I just read this book and it's actually quite quite interesting. His latest book is titled The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics and Driving Us Crazy. It's a very, very good read. I read it very recently. In any case, this is the author of the hockey stick chart, one of the authors of the famous hockey stick chart, which was one of the sources of inspiration for uh, Randall Munro in this graphic uh, in, in his website, X, uh, XKCD. Yeah, this is, pretty, I mean, this is pretty much just the hockey stick chart kind of just on its side and stretched out. Really exactly. It's, the, it's like the hockey stick chart with annotations, with tons of annotations and, and little little pictograms and stuff. So it's a very interesting way of presenting the information. And it's also a lot of fun. This is something that we discuss in previous podcasts or office hours, uh, that uh, how important it is um, uh, to include in some cases, whenever it is appropriate, and goes with the theme, with the topic of your graphic, to include little notes of humor here and there to make your graphic more 
more appealing. Uh, always remembering that obviously the, the priority should be to show the data, show your data first. But then if you have room to include, you know, little pictograms here and there or little notes of humor here and there, that can really enhance the appearance of the graphic. Um, very recently also, I talked, I wrote about a piece published by the Wall Street Journal. So this is my website, thefunctionalart.com. This is the most recent blog a post that I wrote, which is about this page published by the Wall Street Journal a few days back. So um, the graphic is about how yields uh, of, uh, have changed in the past few years. Uh, the graphic itself is not that important, although although the page is quite nice and it has a it has an online version that I would recommend uh, that you visit. I provided the link over here. But what I highlight in my blog post is that the um, uh, the head of the graphics department at the Wall Street Journal, his name is Stuart Thompson. Uh, he mentions in in a tweet promoting this page uh, that uh, this graphic was almost entirely created by the graphics department and he says in one of his tweets how important it is that graphics departments in news organizations are uh, autonomous are able to work on their own create their own stories you know report the data analyze the data contact sources so work like you know actual journals and the reason why i believe that these uh, these points that a student may, made in on twitter are so important is because in the past when i began my career graphics desk desks in many news organizations were service departments and i remember working for service department a service department is basically a department in which you sit in front of a computer waiting for requests from editors and reporters reporters and editors brought the data for you and you were basically the tool the human tool the, that 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 design uh, over their data so rather than being an a, an independent journalist who can report the data and then create the visualization around the data, you needed to wait for those reporters and editors to bring you the information. I believe this is still at the existing model. This is still the way many news organizations work. But as I said in the blog post, if your company is still organized this way, if your graphics desk is still a service desk, you need to change the model. It's very important to empower the graphics desk so the graphics desk becomes producing. A, a, a department because as i said here there's very there's a very strong direct relationship co direct correlation and positive correlation between graphics desks that are autonomous and and the quality of work the people uh, in the news industry who are producing the best data visualization and journalism at the moment think about propublica the washington post you know people in europe etc uh, the, be the best ones out there are actually the graphics desks that are also able to work as, as independent units, right? that, that report the data, gather the data, and then present the data uh, in a meaningful and organized way. Albert, I think this is like a really interesting point, you know, be, you know, because like there's a lot of different ways that you can organize a newsroom, obviously, and I think a lot of people are looking at things like data journalism and just data in general uh, as a, as maybe like an emerging field or as a, as a new field that most reporters should at least have a, a working aptitude with or a working literacy of, you know, somewhere between having like an autonomous data uh, journalism team and and having you know everyday journalists have a better understanding of data. You know, what, what is your recommendation as far as like kind of like a pathway to Towards moving towards uh, to becoming more to becoming more independent to becoming more autonomous. Yeah. Right? So the, the thing is that if you want to to transform a, a graphics desk into a journalism desk, you need to have journalists in the mix. That's the first thing, right? So a graphics desk nowadays. When I began my career, most graphics desks were made of just graphic designers, which is great. You need graphic designers in the mix, otherwise otherwise you are completely lost, right? But graphics designers should not be the only you know, background that people working for graphics desks should have, or web designers. Now we are we are living in a in a digital world, right? You need to have journalists in the mix. You need to have reporters. You need you need to have an editor who is able to basically conceptualize conceptualize ideas. Everybody in the department, regardless of their background, and this should be a decision that comes from the top of the organization. In a graphics desk, everybody should be treated as a journalist, right? It should be respected. It should not be a second class citizen in the newsroom which is something that happened in some places where that i that i worked at right graphic designers 
infographic designers were considered second class citizens in comparison to reporters and editors. So the change comes from the top in the sense of empowering the graphics desk and consider it a critical unit within the newsroom. But it also needs to come from the bar, right? It needs to come from the, the, the initiative of people who work in the graphics desk to basically start acting. So reporting information, double checking information, gathering that information, and then displaying that information. So they should not just focus on the last part of that, the, the portion in which you present the information, right? We need to be information gatherers, not just information information presenters. So it's a it's a it's a basically a double path that you need to take, right? From the top and also from also from the bottom. That sounds good. All right. What else we got today? Well, we have long, lots of stuff. I also would like to highlight some work done by, by my friends at Univision here in, in Miami. So I'm going to just share my screen right now. So for those of you who are not familiar with Univision, Univision is a Spanish-speaking a, a TV station. It has a, a news unit. And several friends of mine work there. And they recently published um, a project. Obviously, this project is in Spanish. But you can always run it through Google Translate, right? Google Translate has a, a it, it works quite decently. Uh, so this is a it's it's a summary of the civil war of the numbers of the civil war in Colombia. As you probably have heard, a uh, peace agreement has been signed between recently between the Colombian government and the um, and the rebel, the militias. And uh, what Univision did was to put together a very large, very long, a uh, data driven story in which they summarize the impact of the civil war on the population. So the project combines multimedia projects. So it combines video, sorry, photographs, text, data visualization. So you have, for example, the first one that you have here is a map of the different districts of Colombia, the provinces of Colombia. It's, they're actually called departments, if I'm not wrong. So you can click on any of these and get a summary of the uh, of the data, what the number of victims, the number of threats, the number of people who have, who were kidnapped. The project project also includes several data maps, static data maps like this one, charts of different kinds. This is a point that I made in my previous um, in previous uh, uh, office hours. That in the past, when I began my career, the way we we obviously I obviously began my career in print media. Graphics and text were text were usually separated on the page. So you had the copy of the story on one side, and then the graphics of the story on the other side. Today, that model doesn't make sense anymore. You need to uh, try to integrate all your assets, all the elements of the story together into a seamless and organic unit. Right. So it's not that you know if you have if you're going to have a very long paragraph with tons of numbers. Why don't you transform that, that paragraph into a data visualization and then insert that visualization in the middle of the, uh, of the story as if it were a paragraph of the story itself. And then the, the, the text of the story can communicate and refer to uh, the visualization and vice versa. So this is a great example of how to do that, how to create, create an integrated, uh, organic, uh, seamless uh, storytelling piece that combines video with photographs with text uh, with data visualization another yeah. part by Univision yeah, before we proceed to discuss this a little bit further which is quite similar to this one but a little bit less ambitious perhaps it is this very small but also quite illuminating analysis by uh, my friends Mariano Safra and Luis Melgar of how Northern Virginia became democratic right the the the, the politics the switch the switch in politic, uh, politic preferences uh, uh, in, in Northern Virginia. So it also combines, again, this one is in English. I mean, Univision translates some of their stories uh, to English on a regular basis. So this is, this is basically a visualization-based analysis of uh, demographic and, and politics changes uh, in Virginia. Again, it's a good example of how to combine uh, text and visuals. They did something similar with Florida. I think that we discussed this in previous office hours. So I would recommend that you take a look at it. It's a great example of how to use uh, static charts and then combine them uh, into a story. You know, about, about, Alberto, just yeah. to your previous comment a minute ago, you know, I think like one of the one of the big takeaways here is, is not just thinking of data visualizations as kind of like the separate or discrete thing that you, you, you kind of put in and, it, it, you know, is, is separate from the 
rest of the piece, but really taking a look at it as part of a whole, right? Whereas yeah. like you have, as you mentioned, you know, up instead of paragraphs of data, let's put the data visualization in there and in conjunction with video or photos or whatever, you know, but, but you know, really thinking about the totalitarian, the, 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 the totality of it and the kind of complete picture of how all these pieces fit together. Exactly. That's, that's a very important point. And it, it actually connects with what I mentioned before. I mentioned Mariano and Luis. Both of them are visualization designers. So they are designers, but they write their own copy. So they don't just produce the graphics. They write the entire story. They report the story, they write the story, and they also do the graphics. They design the graphics uh, that go with the, with the story. Mariano has a long career in infographics. He used to work for uh, El País in Spain. And Luis is also a seasoned reporter, a seasoned journalist who uh, was a student of mine here at the School of Communication at, uh, of the University of Miami. He graduated very recently, this past summer, and then he went directly to work for uh, Univision to do data journalism and, and graphics that are as uh, elegant and, and well-designed as these ones. Very good. All right, so we have more things. I also had another book recommendation. I'm not going to talk that much about it right now, but I, I'm going to leave it here. Um, it's also part of the links that I sent you beforehand. So it's uh, Ian Bogost's uh, new book. It's not about visualization per se. It's more about play and games. It's titled Play Anything, The Pleasure of Limits, The Uses of Boredom, and The Secret of Games. So the title is intriguing enough. And I, I already wrote a very short review in Amazon.com. You can read it over there because I, I finished reading it last night. I read it in just a couple of days. So it's not, it's not about visualization per se, but many of the teachings in the books, many of the thoughts uh, that Ian writes uh, about in, in his book can relate directly to data visualization. How important it is to put constraints, how important it is you know, to, to the playful element of a visualization also. It's an inspiring, an inspiring book. Uh, Ian Bogos, for those of you who don't, who don't know him, is a professor in, at Georgia Tech. Uh, he's also way, well, very well known in the world of, uh, of games. Uh, he's a game designer and a programmer, and he's also a philosopher. So he's a, he's a Renaissance man. He knows about, about everything. He's basically a genius. This is his uh, Twitter profile. And he's also an excellent, excellent writer. So if you're looking for something engaging and illuminating and, and entertaining to read, uh, I would recommend that you take a look at Play Anything. You will learn a lot, not only about design, but also about, about life in general. So Talking about... Yeah, go ahead. Let's take a quick question here. So uh, Mona Abdallah, before we move on uh, too far, she, she actually asked a question that's related to the, what we were just talking about previously as far as being a service-based uh, group within a newsroom. Uh -huh. uh, you know, she said that she can relate to a graphics desk issue of being more of a, of a service. What, what's a solution for this in a small news organization when it's just like a one-person job? Yeah. When, when is, so I have that experience as well. Let me just unshare my screen so you can see me again. Um, here I am. So I have that experience as well, being the only person in a in a newsroom doing doing graphics. That began at the that, that happened at the beginning of my career, uh, right after I, I left the internship that I got at La Voz de Galicia, which is the place where I started. I was hired by a Diario Dieciséis, which was a a, a, lo, a local. It was a national newspaper, but it was more centered in Madrid, in Spain. And it was a small newspaper. And for for a few months or a couple of months, something like that, I was the only person doing graphics there. So I, I still worked as a, as a service one person department, you know, getting requests from journalists, but I was also able to, to start proposing my own topics and my own, my own stories. I have a background in journalism, so that was not hard to do. So it's, it's just a matter of starting doing it. So it's like begin doing it. So if you know that you have stories inside your head that you want to tell, Right. Try to put together proposals and try to bring them up in meetings. So go to your your bosses. Go to go to the editorial meetings, newsroom meetings. And some proposals, just raise your hand. And say, you know, well, I'm the graphics designer, but I have this idea for a story. Sometimes people will not buy that story, but sometimes they will. Perhaps they will help you reshape that story and making it making it better. But you will be able to start owning your own story. So it's not something that will happen you know, in one, in just one day. It is a process of making sure that people notice that you are there and they are, you're also able to come in, come, to come up with your, able of coming up with, uh, with your own stories and report them and, and gather the information for them. Obviously to do that, you need to educate yourself a little bit on, on, on how, 
journalism work. So I, depending on your background, some people come from a background in graphic design and arts. Uh, and in that case, they will need to learn a little bit about how, you know, how to write a story, how to propose a story, how to report it. The same way that myself, coming from a background in journalism, I needed to educate myself in typography, color, composition, and all that kind of, that kind of stuff so I could speak properly about infographics later on, right? You know, and it's interesting, too, because, like, you know, we're talking about, you know, just kind of broadening out your education a little bit. You know, what we were just talking about a minute ago is, like, you, you started to talk about things like game theory. You know, how do, how, does, how do concepts or philosophies around game theory apply to, to the practice of journalism or data journalism? Well, there is. A, if you want to read, if you want to learn about that, uh, Bogos, the author of the book that I recommended, has a book titled "News Games," uh, in which he showcases several examples of stories in journalism that used that were organized and presented as games. So they, they basically challenged people to 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 uh, interrogate the data in a in a playful manner or to play with the data somehow right so i, I think that reading about games can be extremely helpful in the sense of, of you know creating better interfaces for instance many of the best interfaces out there are, are were created by by game designers and there's a reason why you know very good games are so engaging right so it's it is experience obviously it's the fun of the experience but it also has to do with how that experience um was put together and presented to and presented to people so just interface design for example it's something that you can learn from i believe from the world of design and engagement obviously including you know game-like experiences in your visualization you know, bringing the reader into the visualization. So rather than just presenting the story to people, you know, how, allow them to, 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 to integrate themselves or to get into the story or to uh, navigate the story at will. That's, those ideas also come somehow from the world of from the world of video games you know you're right you're, it's so so true you know this is something we also talk quite about quite a quite a bit when we're talking about immersive storytelling in, in the context of like 360 video or vr you know there's a lot i think that is over often overlooked from other you know kind of corners of the industry you know, for example the gaming world you know and, and for a lot of many years you know I, I feel like these game designers have been working a lot of these issues out how to best present information in a way that's interactive immersive pulls the reader or the viewer uh, into that experience in a way that keeps them engaged yeah mm -hmm. I usually say that visualization is not just about presentation or even presentation and exploration it's also about engagement I mean it's, it's the factor of showing people and this is something that I discuss in the truthful art in my latest book calling it the me factor where am i here right so instead of just showing me the entire distribution of wealth of the united states first ask me what my wealth is and then show me in comparison to the rest of the histogram in comparison to the rest of the population right just by doing that you're making that visualization more approachable Right, it made more personal, more related to my own interests, right? And that's just a very simple example, right? a very, very basic example, right? Ask people things, and then, and then, you know, let them play, let them see themselves in the visualization. We've got another question, actually, two questions from uh, Nicole Walter. She asks, uh, Alberto, how do you think, uh, or, or how, what are the process? Aspects of embarking on a career as a freelance uh, infographic designer. She's got a background in journalism. In other words, do Norway's organizations tend to build up their own infographic desks, or do they, do they rely on uh, freelancers? It depends. I mean, beginning as a freelancer, if you don't have any previous experience in the field, can be a little bit daunting. Can be a little bit difficult because you need to you need to build a portfolio. You need to show people what you're what you're able to do. There are several ways you can you can do that. Obviously, one of them would be to create something that gets the attention of the world. And before, remember that I mentioned the projects by Georgia and Stefani. They are data. Right, their project of, of doing postcards with visualizations drawn by hand, that got the attention of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is going to bring them a lot of new business, right? Or the, the other project, Data Sketches by Nadine and, and Shirley, Shirley Wu, the project that I, that I mentioned before. I'm pretty sure that, I mean, it's obvious that they did that for fun. They are having fun with that, right? But at the same time, they are, they are doing something that can prove to potential clients that, that they can handle 
big products and create something that is creative and engaging and beautiful and very well done. So I would say that to get that experience, you can get it by creating your own products and publishing them, but also try to get you know, a job, just a regular job. And it doesn't need to be a job in a news organization. Yes, because as you know, you know, newspapers and magazines, they are going through hard times. Although infographics and visualization and data areas are still hiring, the rest of, the organiza of these organizations are suffering a little bit in terms of uh, job prospects and stuff, right? There are still opportunities there, but I would not narrow my vision and try just to get a job in a news organization. There are many other kinds of organizations that are using a, a visualization and, and infographics, PR agencies, a marketing and advertisement companies, you know, even banks and, and corporate organizations. Some of my, some of the people that I work uh, with the most, some of my, my clients are actually corporate clients I, I, that, that work, that do visualization and infographics to communicate effectively, right? They use journalistic and graphic design principles, um, uh, but they, don't, they are not really news organizations, right? So I, I think that it could be a combination of creating your own projects just to sharpen your skills and show the world what you can do in a creative way and simultaneously trying to get a job that will allow you to, uh, that will discipline you a little bit, right? It's not just the free form, you know, free thinking path uh, that a project like Georgia and Stephanie uh, can allow you, but also the more disciplined approach or the more disciplined way of doing graphics that an organization that you work for uh, will force you to adopt. I think it's great information. Um, okay, we had a couple other examples. Where, what else we have? On well, I have tons of stuff. Let me just share my screen again. So um, I also, as you know, follow a ton of people who, who write about, about visualization. There are several blog posts, very recent blog posts that, that got me excited. For example, I saw that uh, Enrico Bertini is back to blogging. So for those of you who don't know Enrico, Enrico is a professor of visualization at New York a University, and his website is, is called Fell in Love with Data, which is kind of cute. The problem is that Enrico has not updated his blog post in, uh, for a very long time, uh, but he has, he has a resume writing again, and he has a resume writing with a blog post about how he teaches. So this is um, a, a, a post in which he describes how he has flipped his classroom, he now is assigns, you know, things to do for for students to do over over weekends. So There's a long explanation of how he organizes a, his classes, and he promises that this is a this is the first part of a, a of a series apparently. So it, it, it's very 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 promising. For those of you who don't know Enrico, by the way, he's one of the people behind um, another data stories behind the data stories a podcast. So this is one of the most famous podcasts in the world of uh, data visualization. Data Stories is a podcast uh, run by Enrico himself. And then also Moritz Stefaner, who is a, a very, very famous visualization designer. If you have never heard of this podcast, I greatly, I strongly recommend that, um, uh, that you visit their website. Uh, this is Enrico, uh, fun, fun friend, and, and, and Moritz. Um, so very, very interesting. But anyway, this is Enrico's website. I will recommend that you visit it. And then we have the 10th anniversary of a uh, Robert Cosara's uh, Eager Eyes. So Eager Eyes is one of the classic websites about data visualization, specifically scientific data visualization and statistical data visualization. So Cosara, Robert Cosara, he used to be a professor at a in North Carolina, and then he left his uh, tenure position to start working for a uh, Tableau software, and he runs this website, uh, eagerize.org, uh, which is one of the one of the best sources out there for news about data visualization. Particularly if you are interested in the science behind data visualization, this is a great resource because he writes on a regular basis about uh, new uh, papers and scientific experiments conducted to analyze which visualizations work and which graphics uh, don't work. So 10th anniversary, they, he has a new, um, a new logo and a new design and several blog posts. Uh, so he, he has just published a blog post here um, about the early history of his, of his website. And he calls, he's going to write a series of blog posts about these 10th anniversaries. He's calling that the blog extravaganza. 
uh, of Eager Eyes. So it's, a series, it's going to be a series of posts about his story. Uh, the controversies also he has been involved with because he's a, uh, he has very strong opinions, Robert, about many things. He's always a very engaging writer. Anyway, I would recommend that you keep an eye on, on eagerize.org. Uh, and then, I don't remember if we, wrote, if we spoke about this, but there's another famous person also blogging. Uh, his name is John Greenwaite. Uh, for those of you who don't know John, John is what basically one of the one of the godfathers of infographics and, and data visualization. He's he used to be the infographics director at a Condé Nast Traveler magazine after spending years doing infographics for Brit British newspapers, and then he moved to the U.S. and now he's a professor at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, and he recently launched his blog. It's titled Infographics for the People, which is very descriptive of what the blog is about. Uh, John says that you know the current trend of uh, data visualization is making uh, graphics sometimes a little bit hard to understand and a little bit hard to read, perhaps. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with that, but he has a point. And his blog is basically about how to make infographics more approachable and data visualization more approachable for the people, for the people in general, for the general public. So my recommendation is also that you visit his website. It's a very, very interesting uh, website with tons of examples. The latest one is uh, titled When Infographic Dinosaurs Roam the Earth <laughs> and describe his early years doing infographics by hand, actually with photographs of him drawing you know, his beautiful graphics uh, by hand and then layering you know, several layers of illustration, one on top of the other. It actually shows you how, how complex, how complicated it was to create a visualization uh, in the past, back in the 80s, for example. And then we have, I have examples from many other, many other places. I, I just listed them all uh, over here. I don't know if we will have the time to go, uh, go over them, all of them. Uh, they are just listed over here. I would like to highlight the work of the uh, Berliner uh, Morgan Post. I think that this is something that he, their work, uh, we highlighted their work in the past, uh, in past, uh, in past uh, office hours. And I also showcased some of their projects in my latest book, The Truthful Art. Uh, the, Ber the Morgan Post is uh, one of the most interesting uh, European news organizations when it comes to data journalism and visualization. Their work is uh, consistently uh, amazing. This is just one example. These are election results in, in Berlin, right? This is color coded according to you know, who, what party won on each part of Berlin. And as you can see, the political landscape in, in Germany, and this is true of many other uh, European countries, it's much more fragmented than it is in the United States, right? We don't have just two main parties. We usually have tons of different parties that are basically tied with each other um, uh, in, the, in the polls or, and also in the results. So this is an interactive graphic that lets you explore the data at will. You can click on any, any portion that you want. You can type your address over here. This is obviously in German, but again, you can run these through a, a Google Translate, which is what I'm doing over here, right? So you can automatically translate this thing. And then you can, if you live in, 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 in Germany, you can type your address here. And they recently published these, I, I, I have just seen this one, so I have not had time to navigate this project over here, but it, it looks extremely interesting. So this is the, a visualization of the Berlin Marathon 2016. And it shows you, uh, each little dot that you see in there represents a person. All right, so as you can see the progression of the marathon. You can see that at the beginning, everybody was together in this, this big block of red, but then some people started moving away from the main body of the, of the marathon. Some people started falling behind. This little dot at the very, very end over here is probably myself running the <laughs> early marathon. I'm not a runner, I'm more, a, more of a swimmer. And, and I, I don't know, I really, really like how animation it was used in this project. It's so, so well done. And it's something that we pointed out in previous conversations, right? How important a good animation is for data visualization. Animation not used as a decoration, but animation used to better inform the people who are seeing your visualization. It's such a great visualization. You know, you know, I think, you know, marathons and other types of events where you have a large groups of people, you know, always provide this really amazing opportunity just to, you know, 
not only show the scale of an event like this, but but you know to collect data and actually use that data in a way to help tell that narrative. So you know, is this like just pulling from like the tracker data uh, from the individual? So, as I said, I have not had the time to go over this one with a lot of detail. I just saw it like like ten minutes before we began our conversation, but. The animation really caught my eye. It was, it's so engaging. And, and I really like the color palette also. It's very, very pleasant. You can filter. You can see all people or only women or only men. Right? This is something that I, I noticed before we began. There you go. So you can, you can filter. Right? I don't know. I really liked it. I really liked That's it. That's so cool. You can pause it. You can change the speed. You can, you can begin again. Very, very well done. Very elegant. So the Morgan Post is one of the organizations. This is something that I pointed out before, right, in previous conversations, that when we talk about visualization and, and good examples of visualization coming from news organizations, we tend to focus a little bit too much on, on the, the usual suspects, right? The New York Times, the Washington Post. Obviously, everybody loves those organizations. I'm a huge fan of the New York Times. I receive my print New York Times Every day, you can actually see it sitting on the floor. The New York Times is down there. I just read it. That's my, my, my current copy of the New York Times. I love the New York Times. But it's not just the New York Times. There are many other people out there producing wonderful work. ProPublica, 538, the Morgan Post, you know, El Confidencial in Spain, or El Diario in Spain, you know, Estado de São Paulo in Brazil. There's so many people producing great work these days that it's easy is too easy uh, to miss, you know, great projects if you don't keep an eye on Twitter and Facebook and, 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 or, 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 on, or on these office hours, right, just to discover uh, these great projects. And that's the whole reason why in the latest chapter of my, of my most recent book, uh, you will only find three or four examples coming from the New York Times. All the other 50 or 60 examples that I showcase come from organizations or even individuals that may not be as famous as those organizations are, but people who are, I believe that, that deserve a lot of attention, a lot of our attention. And I think it's a really good point. And Alberta, you know, and for those uh, people who maybe have not seen other prior uh, data journalism roundups, uh, you know, definitely worth checking out on our YouTube account. <clears throat> There's always links to all of the examples that we go over in the description of the actual videos. And obviously, Alberto and I are going through and uh, kind of pulling out, you know, key learnings and things to pay attention to within each one of these visualizations. Um, I've got a stack of books now that I am you know, doing my best to work through because of these data visualization roundups. So, Alberto, thank you for giving me, uh, taking up all of my free time reading all these books. Well, but I think there's like an incredible amount that. of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, there are other projects that I that I highlighted that I that I send you links for. Um, I, I don't know if we have time to go over them. I would like to just mention that uh, uh, something about conferences. Uh, uh, several conferences have been announced already. So, uh, in case you're interested, one of them is the Tapestry Conference. Uh, this is an invitation-only conference about visualization. You need to basically submit your request to be invited. It is limited to, I believe, 100 people. That's the, that's the limit, or 120 or something like that. And you can just click on that and request your invite. I did that. I don't know if they will invite me or not. I would love to be there. Um, it's usually a lot of fun. I attended one. I watched one of the keynotes one year, and it was a lot of fun. And this year it's going to be in Florida, in, in St. Augustine. And um, the reason is it, this is going to happen in Florida is that the tapestry usually uh, coincides and takes place uh, in towns that are close to NICAR. Now, what is NICAR? NICAR is the investigative reporters uh, conference. It also happens every year, investigative reporters and editors, NICAR. So this is a large gathering of people who use data and visualization uh, in the news industry. This conference is actually quite large, like 1,000, 1,200 people every year. Some reason the, the, their website is not loading right now, but oh, it, it loaded already, so it, it's coming up. All right, there you go. So that, this is the NICAR conference. So uh, NICAR is going to take place, if I'm not wrong, in Jacksonville, and St. Agustin is very close to Jacksonville. So you can go to Tapestry first if you, they, they invite you to go. And then the day after, you can basically drive to NICAR and attend NICAR. That's exactly what I'm planning to do, by the way. I'm planning to attend both conferences if I get invited to, if I get invited to Tapestry, obviously. But otherwise, I will just, you know, uh, go to NICAR. And then the, um, the Malofiek conference. This hasn't been announced yet, but... 
the dates are already there. This is going to be in the last week of uh, March 2017. Their website has not been updated yet, uh, but, but it will. So it will be in the last week of March. The Mall of the Egg, for those of you who don't know about it, it's, <clears throat> in my opinion, the most important gathering of uh, people who do infographics and visualization in the news, journalistic infographics. It happens every year, actually. Next year, 2017, is going to be the 25th anniversary of the conference. It's going to be a, a pretty big event. They're they are, uh, putting together uh, something um, uh, really big. Uh, the registration is not open for this conference, but you know I would add it to your calendars if you can. If it happens every year in Spain, in Pamplona, in northern Spain, beautiful city, uh, at the end of March. So, and then we have, you know, other examples over here, but that perhaps people will want to visit. Uh, but I don't think that we have time for them today, right? It's, no, uh, we only have just a few more minutes here, but we will be linking, and we actually have already linked all of these examples in the description of the yeah. uh, of the data visualization roundup yeah. on YouTube. Uh, for those of you that are joining in uh, not live, uh, you should always be able to find those uh, on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Google News Lab. Yeah. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, you can follow us on our social media accounts. Uh, you can find out more information on how to take advantage of data visualization and other tools that Google has at g.co slash newslab. And Alberto, do you want to give a quick last minute shout out to where people can find you online? Yes, my, my website, as I mentioned before, my, my personal website is thefunctionlearn.com. I also have a small corporate website, my name and last name, albertocairo.com, but I don't update that that often. The one that I update and where I write about visualization is uh, the functional art.com. And I would just recommend that you take a look at the other projects that, that I didn't comment on, but I still, uh, you will find those links underneath the, the video today. Um, I, I put together, you know, projects by the New York Times, for example. They wrote a very good story about polling and how, how, how different researchers will look at polling data in different ways and how the results may be fair depending on, on how they analyze and manipulate the data. It's quite interesting. Put their project by the Washington Post. They have a very beautiful 3D model uh, uh, of the um, museum of the National Museum of African American History. In there, I, I believe that that's the right name of that museum. So they put together a beautiful 3D rendering of the museum with a cutaway. It's extremely, extremely beautiful. Take a look at that. They also put together a good, uh, several good graphics about about the election. So uh, even if we, don't, uh, we didn't have time to comment on those, I would still recommend that you visit them. I, as I usually tell my students, the best way to learn how to do visualization is to copy people. So try to find role models and, and copy them. And I mean, and don't plagiarize them, but get inspiration from those examples, right? One of the books that I re re recommended in, in previous conversations was um, Still Like an Artist by Austin Kleon, which is, uh, actually talks about that, right? How every single artist, journalist, any creative type, any creative person begins her or his career by copying the masters and then departing from them later on when she develops her own style. I love it. Alberto, yeah. it's been a pleasure to talk with you as always. And uh, we'll be doing another one of these hopefully next month. Next month. Yeah, we'll All be right. there. We'll start putting the list together. Fantastic. So for those of you, again, who just, uh, this is your first time, we'll be uh, doing another one of these in another, uh, about another four weeks. So check us out on our YouTube account. We'll be posting more information about that as time goes on. Uh, and we'll see you next month. Thanks a lot, Alberto. Thank you. Take care.